teething ring by james cosy anyone can make an error but the higher the society the more disastrous the mistake this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by dale grothman teething ring by james cosy Half an hour before, while she had been engrossed in the current soap opera, and Harry Jr. was screaming in his crib, Melinda would naturally have slammed the front door in the little man's face. However, when the bell rang, she was wearing her new Chinese red housecoat, had just lustered her nails to a blinding scarlet, and Harry Jr. was sleeping like an angel. Yawning, Melinda answered the door, and the little man said, beaming, "'Excellent day! I have gee-gaws for information!' Melinda did not quite recoil. He was perhaps five feet tall, with a gleaming hairless scalp and a young old face. He wore a plain gray tunic, and a peddler's tray hung from his thin shoulders. "'Don't want any,' Melinda said flatly. "'Please,' he had great beseeching amber eyes. "'They all say that. I haven't much time. I must be back to the university by noon.' "'You're working your way through college?' He brightened. Yes, I suppose you could call it that. Alien anthropology major. Melinda softened. The initiation those frats pulled nowadays. Shaving the poor guy's head, eating goldfish. It was criminal. Well, she said grudgingly, what's in the tray? Langlers, said the little man eagerly. Oscilloscopes, portable force field generators, a neural distorter. Melinda's face was blank. The little man frowned. You use them, of course. This is a class four culture. Melinda essayed a weak shrug, and the little man sighed with relief. His eyes fled past her to the blank screen of the TV set. Ah, a monitor, he said, smiling. For a moment I was afraid. May I come in? Melinda shrugged, opened the door. This might be interesting like a vacuum cleaner salesman who had cleaned her drapes last week for free. And Kitty Kyle Battle's life wouldn't be on for almost an hour. My name is Porteous, said the little man with an eager smile. I'm doing a thematic on class four cultures. He whipped out a stylus, began jotting down notes. The TV set fascinated him. It's turned off right now, Melinda said. Porteous' eyes widened impossibly. You mean, he whispered in horror, that you're exercising class five privileges? This is terribly confusing. I get doors slammed in my face when class fours are supposed to have a splendid Gregarian quotient. You do have atomic power, don't you? Oh, sure, said Melinda uncomfortably. This wasn't going to be much fun. Space travel? The little face was intent, sharp. Well, Melinda yawned, looking at the blank screen. They've got Space Patrol, Space Cadet, Tales of Tomorrow. Excellent. Rocket ships or force fields? Melinda blinked. Does your husband own one? Melinda shook her blonde head helplessly. What are your economic circumstances? Melinda took a deep, rasping breath and said, Listen, mister, is this a demonstration or a quiz program? Oh, my excuse. Demonstration, certainly. You will not mind the questions? Questions? There was an ominous glint in Melinda's blue eyes. Your delightful primitive customs, art forms, personal habits. Look, said Melinda, crimsonly, this is a respectable neighborhood, and I'm not answering any Kinsey report. Understand? The little man nodded, scribbled. Personal habits are taboo. I so regret the demonstration. He waved grandly at the tray. Anti-grav sandals, a portable solar converter? Apologizing for this miserable selection, but on Capella they told me. He followed Melinda's entranced gaze, selected a tiny green vial. This is merely a regenerative solution. You appear to have no cuts or bruises. Oh, said Melinda nastily. Cures warts, cancer, grows hair, I suppose. Porteous brightened. 
Of course, I can see you scan. Amazing. He scribbled further with his stylus, glancing up, blinking at the obvious scorn on Melinda's face. Here, try it. You try it. Now watch him squirm. Porteous hesitated. Would you like me to grow an extra finger? Hair? Grow some hair, Melinda tried not to smile. The little man unstopped the vial, poured a shimmering drop on his wrist, frowning. Must concentrate, he said. Thorium-based suspended solution. Really jolts the endocrines. Complete control. See? Melinda's jaw dropped. She stared at the tiny tuft of hair which had sprouted on the bare wrist. She was thinking abruptly, unhappily, about the chignon she had bought yesterday. They had let her buy that for eight dollars, when with this stuff she could have a natural one. How much? she inquired cautiously. Half an hour of your time only, said Porteous. Belinda grasped the vial firmly, settled down on the sofa, with one leg tucked carefully underneath her. Okay, shoot, but nothing personal. Porteous was delighted. He asked a multitude of questions, most of them pointless, some naive, and Melinda dug into her infinitesimal fund of knowledge and gave. The little man scribbled furiously, plucking like a gravid hen. You mean, he asked in amazement, that you live in these primitive huts of your own volition? It's a G.I. housing project, Melinda said, ashamed. Astonishing! He wrote, feudal anachronisms and atomic power side by side. Class fours periodically rough it in back-to-nature movements. Harry Jr. chose that moment to begin screaming for his lunch. Porteous sat trembling. Is that a security alarm? My son, said Melinda despondently, and went to the nursery. Porteous followed, and watched the ululating child with some trepidation. Newborn? Eighteen months, said Melinda stiffly, changing diapers. He's cutting teeth. Porteous shuddered. What a pity! Obviously atavistic. Wouldn't the creche accept him? You shouldn't have to keep him here. I keep after Harry to get a maid, but he says we can't afford one. Manifest insecurity, muttered the little man, studying Harry Jr. Definite paranoid tendencies. He's two weeks premature, volunteered Melinda. He's really sensitive. I know just the thing, Porteous said happily. Here. He dipped into the glittering litter on the tray and handed Harry Jr. a translucent prism. A neural disorder. We use it to train regressives on Rigel, too. It may be of assistance. Melinda eyed the thing doubtfully. Harry Jr. was peering into the shifting crystal depths with a somewhat strained expression. Speeds up the neural flow, explained the little man proudly. Helps tap the unused 80%. The pre-symptomatic memory is unaffected due to automatic cerebral lapse in case of overload. I'm afraid it won't do much more than cube his present IQ. An intelligent idiot is still an idiot, but... How dare you, Melinda's eyes flashed. My son is not an idiot. You get out of here this minute and take your, your things with you. She reached for the prism. Harry Jr. squalled. Melinda relented. Here, she said angrily, fumbling with her purse. How much are they? Medium of exchange? Porteous rubbed his bald skull. Oh, I really shouldn't. But it'll make a wonderful addendum to the chapter on malignant primitives. What is your smallest denomination? Is a dollar okay? Melinda was hopeful. Porteous was pleased with the picture of George Washington. He turned the bill over and over in his fingers and at last bowed low and formally apologized for any taboo violations and left via the front door. Crazy fraternities, mumbled Melinda, turning on the TV set. Kitty Kyle was dull that morning. At length, Melinda used some of the liquid in the green vial on her eyelashes, and was quite pleased with the results, and hid the rest in the medicine cabinet. Harry Jr. was a model of docility the rest of the day. While Melinda watched TV and munched chocolates, did and redid her hair, 
Harry Jr. played quietly with the crystal prism. Toward late afternoon, he crawled over to the bookcase, wrestled down an encyclopedia, and pawed through it, gurgling with delight. He definitely, Melinda decided, would make a fine lawyer some day, not a useless putterer like Big Harry, who worked all hours overtime in that damned lab. She scowled as Harry Jr., bored with the encyclopedia, began reaching for one of Big Harry's tomes on nuclear physics. One putterer in the family was enough, but when she tried to take the book away from him, Harry Jr. howled so violently that she left well enough alone. At 6.30, Big Harry called from the lab with the usual despondent message that he would not be home for supper. Melinda said a few resigned things about cheerless dinners eaten alone, hinted darkly at what lonesome wives sometimes did for company, and Harry said he was very sorry, but this might be it, and Melinda hung up on him in a temper. Precisely fifteen minutes later the doorbell rang. Melinda opened the front door and gaped. This little man could have been Proteus double, except for the black metallic tunic and the glacial gray eyes. Miss Melinda Adams? Even the voice was frigid. Y yes Why? Major Nord, Galactic Security, the little man bowed. You were visited earlier this morning by one Porteus. He spoke the name with a certain disgust. He left a neural distorter here, correct? Melinda's nod was tremulous. Major Nord came quietly into the living room, shut the door behind him. My apologies, madam, for the intrusion. Porteus mistook your world for a class four culture instead of a class nine. Here, he handed her the crumpled dollar bill. You may check the serial number. The distorter, please. Melinda shrunk limply into the sofa. I don't understand, she said painfully. Was he a thief? He was careless about his spatial coordinates, Major Nord's teeth showed in the faintest of smiles. He's been corrected. Where is it? Now look, said Melinda with some asperity, that thing's kept Harry Jr. quiet all day. I bought it in good faith, and it's not my fault. Say, have you got a warrant? Madam, said the Major with dignity, I dislike violating local taboos, but must I explain the impact of a neural distorter on a backwater culture? What if your Neanderthal had been given an atomic blaster? Where would you have been today? Swinging through trees, no doubt. What if your Hitler had force fields? He exhaled. Where is your son? In the nursery, Harry Jr. was contentedly playing with his blocks. The prism lay glinting in the corner. Major Nord picked it up carefully, scrutinized Harry Jr. His voice was very soft. You say he was playing with it? Some vestigial maternal instinct prompted Melinda to shake her head vigorously. The little man stared hard at Harry Jr., who began whimpering. Trembling, Melinda scooped up Harry Jr. Is that all you have to do? Run around frightening women and children? Take your old distorter and get out. Leave decent people alone. Major Nord frowned. If only he could be sure. He peered stonily at Harry Jr., muttered, Definite egomania, but doesn't seem to have affected him. Strange. Do you want me to scream? Melinda demanded. Major Nord sighed. He bowed to Melinda, went out, closed the door, touched a tiny stud on his tunic, and vanished. The manners of some people, Melinda said to Harry, Jr. She was relieved that the Major had not asked for the green vial. Harry, Jr. also looked relieved, although for quite a different reason. Big Harry arrived home a little after eleven. There were small worry creases about his mouth and forehead, and a leaden cast of defeat in his eyes. He went into the bedroom, and Melinda sleepily told him about the little man working his way through college by peddling silly goods, and about the rude cop named Nord. And Harry said it was simply astonishing. And Melinda said, Harry, you had a drink. 
I had two drinks, Harry told her owlishly. You married a failure, dear. Part of the experimental model vaporized. Whoosh. Just like that. On paper it looked so good. Melinda had heard it all before. She asked him to see if Harry Jr. was covered, and Big Harry went unsteadily into the nursery, sat down by his son's crib. Poor little guy, he mused. Your old man's a bum, a useless tinkerer. He thought he could send a man to the stars on a string of helium nuclei. Oh, he was smart, thought of everything. Auxiliary jets to kick off the negative charge, bigger mercury vapor banks, a fine straight thrust of positive alpha particles. He hiccuped, but his face was in his hands. Didn't you ever stop to think that a few air molecules would defocus the stream? Try a vacuum, stupid. Big Harry stood up. Did you say something, son? Careful, said Harry Jr. Big Harry reeled into the living room like a somnambulist. He got a pencil and paper, began jotting frantic formulae. Presently he called a cab and raced back to the laboratory. Melinda was dreaming about little bald men with diamond-studded trays. They were chasing her. They kept pelting her with rubies and emeralds. All they wanted was to ask questions, but she kept running. Harry Jr. clasped tightly in her arms. Now they were ringing alarm bells. The bells kept ringing, and she groaned, sat up in bed, and seized the telephone. Darling, Big Harry's voice shook, I've got it. More auxiliary shielding plus a vacuum. We'll be rich. That's fine, said Melinda crossly. You woke the baby. Harry Jr. was sobbing bitterly into his pillow. He was sick with disappointment. Even the most favorable extrapolation showed it would take him nineteen years to become master of the world. An eternity. Nineteen years. The end of Teething Ring by James Causey